You are now listening to episode 72 featuring Jonathan Jones. Just realizing where I wanted to go and seeing that I've seeing and knowing that I've met a lot of other guys who were really skilled athletes, but then they always would be academically ineligible. You know, on ESPN, you see the bottom line. It's like this person can't play or they're, the team made it to a bowl or a championship and they can't play because they're ineligible. So just knowing that I didn't want that that stain to be on my name, I just knew I had to do something different. So just like you said, I started talking with the coaches and then being able to you know, get a structure in place, blocking out distractions. And that was really what really shifted for me, not doing what everybody else was doing, but just doing what I needed to do to make sure that I would be successful. Yeah, gotta aim for the top like Hello, yeah, I can never doubt myself, I know better All of you critics be acting like you know better Blowing the smoke, but I know when the dust settles so I'm in my element, it's evident that this level to the game so What's going on people, welcome back to the Athletes to Athletes podcast And today I'm sitting down with Jonathan Jonathan, really happy that you reached out on LinkedIn Always love making some new connections and things And, you know, happy that we were able to connect and discuss some things And um, you know, so I'm happy that you're here on the show. Welcome to the Athletes Athletes Podcast, man. We're glad you can come on. Most definitely, man. Ryan, glad to be here with you, man. Glad glad to just hang out and, and see where the conversation goes. So glad to be here. Yeah. So as I told you, let's start now. Five questions. So first conversation, uh, first first question I have for you is who's somebody you looked up to as a as a young athlete when you know when you were coming up? Uh when I was coming up. Man, if I rewind it back that far, there were so many just, I, I was just so immersed with college sports. So college football, college sports as a whole. Um, but one person that stands out, even though I didn't really play football, Maurice Claret, just how dominant he was as an as a athlete. And you know, that whole Ohio State was just running it up. So I would definitely say him at like around that high school time, time frame. But yeah, M- Maurice Claret, a beast, a beast. Yeah. Um. When when you were when you were coming up, were were sports the end goal for you, or did you have something else that was on the agenda? And what did you what did you want to be? Yeah. So initially coming up, uh, sports was the end goal, and and this was like right around like that high school time frame um, because I was at Willow High School, and they were the number one high school number one ranked basketball high school program in the country at that time. I didn't play varsity though, Ryan. So, <laughs> you know, but it, it was it was just the fact of seeing the guys who came the years and the years before me. Then I it just gave me uh, an expectation of what could be possible. Uh, but you know, let, later down the road, and we'll, we'll probably talk about it a little bit more. But later down the road, I, I then began to get a more realistic picture. But 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 basketball is is where I was putting my eggs in the basket. That's for sure. As a as a professional, as a as an entrepreneur, what was the the first goal on your list that um, you were able to check off? The first goal for me was man, just trying to figure out how I can get into like schools and start speaking because it's one thing you know for people to talk about entrepreneurship and people talk about business and they always talk about the money, but they don't talk about the process of it all. So it was like. What, what what can I do? How can I find a way to get into these schools? How can I find a way to be able to share a message? It wasn't even really the focus of speaking, but it's just like, I have this book. Um, somebody please take me up on this book. Like, where can I get this in? So that that was the biggest goal for me is just being able to get into a school and then being able to just to share a message just around my book at that time. When you were in college, what was what was the end goal once you became older, right? Obviously, when we're little, we're we're watching professional athletes. We're like, oh, you know, I can remember the Be Like Mike commercials, trying to be like mm-hmm. Michael Jordan. But as you get older, things become a lot more realistic. What was what was the the goals when when the future was a lot more near? For sure. So as as the future became more near, and my knees started to hurt a little bit more, and you know, I started to realize I didn't have stamina like I once did. Uh, it was just, man, just getting a job. And at that point, like around the my later college years, it was, okay, now I'm going to counsel. So I was thinking that I was going to be a therapist, but I later learned that you need more than a bachelor's degree uh, to be a therapist. But that was the goal for me, to be able to help people um, in that way. And, you know, as that basketball window started shrinking, 
then my eyes started to become more a little bit a little bit more open to okay well how can i be a therapist how can i help people and that was the focus for me what was the first thought that popped into your head when your book was finished it's finally done oh my goodness Ryan, when I tell you, man, writing a book, especially the first one, it's like, oh my good, like it seemed so great after being done, but it's 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 stressful, man. So it was like, oh my goodness, I'm done, I'm done with it. But then the thought that came after that is, but now I have to tell people about the book because they won't ever know if I don't tell anybody. But it was just the relief of it being done. I'm like, ha, ah, sigh, <sighs> okay, mm -hmm. can take a breath now. Yeah. So let's dig in a little bit more and, and you know, let's backtrack. And, you know, you, you talked about how basketball was such a big part of your life, but why sports in general? You know, why, why did you gravitate towards the sports community, right? Why wasn't it, you know, more a little bit over here, but why was it sports and why did basketball have such a, have, have such a hold on you? Well, I mean, I, I definitely want to want to thank my parents because they introduced us to a lot of things, right? We were a part of summer reading programs, um, in addition to that, then there was also the opportunity for sports. So uh, the reason why sports was so big for me, I had an older brother. Whatever he did, that's what I did. He played baseball. I played t-ball. He was playing basketball. Then I tried to play basketball, right? So that was a big piece for me. And then as I began to grow a little bit taller, it, it, it helped me be comfortable in who I was. So that identity piece that I never actually thought about until now, but as I'm growing taller and being 6'2", uh, and being above six foot, like in, you know, right around that middle school time, I'm looking around and some of my other friends are around that same height. So I, I'm not looked at like a freak or I'm not looked at as like an Amazon or whatever. But it was that community that welcomed me in just based on, you know, my height and based on my stature. So that was a big piece of uh, why I, you know, took the sports route. But even further than that, I mean, it was fun, right? You know, the just natural competition and being able to build friends and being able to build relationships through the vehicle of basketball made it made it easier um, for me just to lean that way versus, you know, reading a book by myself, which is great, you know, very informative. But at the same time, it wasn't as fun, as engaging as sports could be in that way. Mm -hmm. So as you, you know, you're growing up, you're an athlete, you're playing sports and things like that. The college goal starts to come into play. How did you start to put your foot forward to make it to college? And what type type of things were you looking at in the school that you eventually wanted to attend? Everybody has boxes they want to check, but it's it's tough to get all those boxes. It's really yeah. tough to get all every single one of them. What boxes were you trying to check as a high school athlete and as a you know a high school student so that you would get on to that next level of academics? For sure. So uh, the boxes that I was trying to check that never got checked, I wanted to go to a Division One school, you know, the UNC's, the Notre Dame's, the NC State's and the Duke's, all these places that, you know, I would see on TV every weekend, every week. Uh, these were the institutions I wanted to go to. But as I started getting to my later years uh, in high school, uh, I started to fall off more and more academically. I started to become removed and disengaged. And uh, at that point, I, it just got to a point to where I just was trying to graduate. Ryan, I was just trying to get out of there, man. I was, it, was, it was a struggle um, my, my senior year um, high school because uh, I, I faced some adversity. But even outside of that, um, then, then the piece for me came to where, okay, I just want to graduate. And then after that, I knew I had to go to college because my dad, he's an attorney, and my mother, she's an accountant. So it was just under, it was understood that that was the next route. Mm -hmm. uh, my grades were so terrible the, that I didn't get the opportunity to get accepted to Division I institutions. And the opportunity that I had was um, going to a junior college. So attended Richland Junior College out here in Dallas. And by way of doing that, grades weren't good enough to uh, be able to play on a team because I, I wasn't even eligible for the most part. And I wasn't, wasn't taking enough hours. But then what ended up happening was I found the coach, met the coach, and then he was like, well, you know, we don't have spots on the team, but you can you can be like our team manager. So that was like the entry point for me into college and and really just 
still finding, still having that passion for the sport, but also just realizing that in order for me to get the benefit of playing for the team and just being around the team, uh, there were also some requirements that were expected of me. So I had to take, you know, the allotted number of hours and I had to begin to be eligible and these things. But uh, I, I thank the game for that, because if, if that wasn't there, I wouldn't have I really probably wouldn't have stayed around school much. Yeah. So you you mentioned that the grades weren't on point and that, you know, both your parents were in high level academic jobs. Right. Accountant, attorney. It's expected for you to go on to the next level academics. And mm-hmm. I know, I mean, I, I had my troubles academically when I made it to college as well. So, you know, I remember the conversations that I had with my parents. What were the conversations like for you when things start slipping academically with your parents that helped you refocus and helped you get back to at least what your goals were and what you wanted to accomplish? So my, my mom, who I was staying with at the time, she was like, son, uh, because it got to the point to where... I ended up taking the same math class three times. So my mom told me, she was like, well, if you have to take this again, um, that's going to be on you. And you're gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to pay for it. You're going to have to take care of that with your student loans or however you do that. So that was one piece that, that kind of was like uh, a coming to Jesus moment type deal. And then my math professor also let me know. She said, Jonathan, she said, I don't have time to stay after and help you. However, there's a tutoring center right here and you can come to the tutoring center whenever you can ask them for help. They'll sit there and work with you through the problems. So that was when, um, one, I stopped going to sleep in class. That was when I started uh, paying attention, taking notes, and then going to the tutoring center when I had a free period instead of just hanging out and just hanging around. And then that was when I realized, wow, if I don't understand something, these people are here to help me. And, And just putting that in place, and realizing that there's a system and a process for everything, that really helped me in the future as I started taking other classes in English. And I wouldn't even wait, waste time and try to struggle through it myself. I would just say, well, hey, I'm just going to work on this up in the tutoring center, and then I'm going to ask for help as soon as I need it. So that's what really got me back on that trajectory of, uh, well, a positive trajectory as opposed to you know, things dwindling down. So I'm grateful for, you know, the tutoring center at at Richland College and, you know, those people there because tutors are people that I don't know how I viewed them before, but I'm just grateful that, you know, they understand the subject matter well enough to say, hey, you you do, you get this down. Now, you know, we can start and move forward. And, you know, this can apply to all areas of life, right? You need help, ask for it. Yeah, for sure. And you, you mentioned that you were able to become the manager on the basketball team. But when we met during our prep meeting, you said you, you were able to finally become part of the team as well. How did you earn your spot on the team from just getting a spot as the manager as well as getting back on track academically? How did you put in the work to make all of these things come into focus? Yeah, so it, it came to the point to where uh, I had to start doing some things on my own. Um, so one piece was, yes, I was a team manager, but then uh, in, in that dead time, I would make sure to, to leverage and utilize the, the tutoring center. Uh, but then the other aspect was uh, the coach let me know, uh, because he, he, he saw me actually before, because I was, I was on the intramural basketball team, or not intramural team, but there was intramural teams. And mm-hmm. I, was this, I was the second highest scorer there. So I was like, coach, come check me out. You know, come check me out. Uh, so that that was something that that also, you know, helped me uh, build rapport with the coach. But then even in addition to that, just realizing where I wanted to go and seeing that I've uh, seeing and knowing that I've met a lot of other guys who were really skilled athletes. But then they always would be academically ineligible. You know, on ESPN, you see the bottom line. It's like this person can't play or they're, the team made it to a bowl or a championship and they can't play because they're ineligible. So just knowing that I didn't want that that stain to be on my name, I just knew I had to do something different. So just like you said, I started talking with the coaches and then being able to, you know, get a structure in place, blocking out distractions. And that was really what really shifted for me, not doing what everybody else was doing, but just doing what I needed to do to make sure that I would be successful. So that was the biggest part. So, I mean, so far what I've seen is you've had to refocus and regroup, 
you know, a good amount throughout high school, throughout college to get yourself where you wanted to be. You also mentioned that you, that grad school wasn't an option, right? It, it wasn't something that you were looking to do. You were looking to get your degree, get out of school and start making a difference. How did you then pivot once you said, okay, grad school isn't, isn't for me. I really want to start making a difference now. How did you make that pivot? And what did you do once you got out of college? Yeah. So once I got out of college, uh, Ryan, I did anything and everything, man. Uh, I started, you know, I started delivering phone books door to door. Uh, I started um, working at retail spots and I, I was doing all of these jobs uh, only to realize that they, that yes, I was getting the opportunity to connect with people, but I wasn't getting to connect with people in the way that I really desired to. And then there was a point to where um, actually where one of my old bosses from, well, I volunteered with him and then he became a boss. But uh, I started to work for this nonprofit. It was called Services of Hope. And this was where uh, I began to be a program manager and where I began to tutor kids, right? So pre-K through fifth grade, I began to tutor kids and did this program for maybe like uh, a year or so and going into the summer. And this exposed me to speaking. Because I, I would have to stand up in front of about 200 kids and say, hey, listen up, listen up. This is what we're doing. Y'all need to calm down. Uh, but it was the, the speaking and teaching aspect uh, and those, those attributes that really began to be revealed there. So that was what parlayed me into, um, like what I was saying before, into wanting to reach out to different colleges and schools and seeing just where I can teach you know, college students and by way of teaching them so they didn't make the same mistakes that I made with having to take the same class three times and not paying attention like my whole first semester of college. So that was when that change started to happen with, you know, with incorporating some of the principles from my book that we talked about earlier. And that began to open up the doors um, for me going back to Richland, where it all started. Right. This is where I learned how to become not just an effective student, but learn how to become a man with the coaches that we had there. So then I went back to Richland and I was like, hey, I want to speak. I want to speak. What do I need to do? I want to speak. And the lady's like, uh, I don't I don't know, Jonathan. Her name was Christy Neely at the time. She's like, Jonathan, I, I don't know um, about how to get you to speak, but there's this men's group that you might be a good person to share with them. And then that's when I got one of my first paid speaking opportunities from a school by way of me teaching the principles from my book just to those men in the classroom. So that was what really opened it all up uh, in terms of the pivot that, that you were speaking of. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's dig into the book a little bit. How did you get to the premise of what your book was going to be about? So I, I'd have to thank my dad. So my dad, he goes by Dr. Fred Jones. He's the one who told me, he said, John, if you're in fifth grade, then you can help a third grader. If you're a high school student, you can help a middle schooler. So he, he really helped me develop the premise of the book by these two things. The first thing he said was, um, just like what I was speaking about, whatever you've accomplished or overcame, you can teach somebody else how to navigate through that. And then the other piece that he said is you want to set up every chapter of your book to where you can be paid uh, $9.97 an hour, right? So he, he operates from the mindset of being able to share and speak on your experience. And that's what I did, right? So I sat down uh, and began just to jot out, you know, things that I've overcame in my life uh, and principles that, that I've been taught over the years that have served me well and, you know, continue to serve me. So that, that's really where it started. So him just challenging me on that and him just wanting to set me up for success by way of me having, you know, a product, a book to where wherever I go, it, it, it will create an opportunity for, for me to stand out a little bit. Mm -hmm. So since writing your book, becoming a speaker, you've had two TED Talks. You've been, you know, speaking at countless universities. How did all of this come to fruition? How did you make all of this happen from the kid that was falling asleep in class to now right? Speaking in front of these big time colleges and universities, promoting your own book. And like I said, doing multiple Ted talks. Yeah. So Ryan, honestly, it is the, the, the way I would put it is, is, is betting on myself. 
So in order for me to, to, to write my book and to learn that whole process from my dad, Dr. Fred Jones, I paid him $5,000, paid him $5,000. And then he taught me the whole process on how to write a book, how to make it a, a number one bestseller. Um, and from there, it, it didn't stop. Right. So after writing the book, then I, I met an old teammate from my college basketball team and we met at a Waffle House. We talked and he was like, I have this speaking coach. Man, you should consider a speaking coach since you have a book. And then he helped get me into um, into that group. What I didn't know at the time was uh, he got a referral fee. So I'm not sure if he really believed that I'd be a good speaker <laughs> or a good fit or if he just wanted a little kickback. But either way, you know, I'm, I'm not mad at it. I understand. But then I invested with 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 that program. And the gentleman's name was Kendall Fickling. He was my second business coach. And then he showed us how to go out and how to, you know, be able to secure speaking opportunities. But it, it really came from the competitive edge that I had in basketball. And then when that time was up, it, it had that energy had to go somewhere. Right. It, just, just like uh, any object in motion stays in motion. Right. So just just being able to take that that same energy that I had, that same drive, and then just began to plug it into other passionate areas of my life. So that that's really what kicked off kicked off the journey so working with my dad working with Kendall and then the, the levels just began to elevate over time because lastly uh, during the pandemic this is when I really began to get clear on that I really want to work with student athletes uh, because I realized that I have experienced that uh, either some student athletes have faced will face or they're not even thinking about it just yet but you know by way of me suffering an injury with with a shin splint and not shin splint with a stress fracture in my shin and having to wear the boot, then I can speak to that and I can speak to going in a dark place and like depression all with that instance, right? And then the other side of me winning a junior college national championship from being a walk on that was the team manager, right? So taking all of those experiences and and understanding that everybody has something that they can extract from what they've gone through and what they've been through in life, so. You know, that's the way I just desire to do it and continue to do it just through speaking and, and, and just through leveraging podcasting because our voices are so powerful. But if we just, you know, never share them or we sit on our stories, then who will know? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned podcasting and one of your premises is that all student athletes should have a podcast. And, you, okay. you know, you've said that you've said that multiple times. How did you come to that conclusion and why do you feel that all student athletes should have a podcast? Yeah, and then just just like I told you before, let me let me put the let me put the caveat on it. Like I told you before in our pre talk, um, with training, I'll put the asterisk by it. All student athletes should have a podcast yeah. with training, with proper training. Okay, and the reason I say that is because I don't know uh, of a better tool that will do what colleges, universities organizations, teams, coaches, athletic departments say that they have the goal to do in terms of holistically developing a student athlete better than a podcast, right? Because with a podcast, we can talk networking, you know, like me and you, we connected on LinkedIn and now we're here and this is, you know, a podcast. This is media right here. Um, it's going to further their soft skills. So helping them to be succinct in their, in their messages and their ideas and their beliefs and then being able to share those. So public speaking and being able to brag on yourself subtly, right? So doing those things and critically thinking and coordinating, you know, podcasts, interview times and furthering relationships, all that comes through the podcast. The branding aspect comes and happens through the development of your voice and your podcast, identifying your target audience. This happens through podcasting. So I, I don't I don't know of a better tool or a better avenue to prepare a student athlete holistically or an athlete as a whole, right, holistically, um, than podcasts. So that's why I say, you know, every every student athlete or every athlete should have a podcast with proper training. Yeah. And we've seen a lot more athletes get in on that premise. You know, you, you, mm -hmm. you're seeing a whole bunch of them now, right? You have, you have up and smoke with two former, you know, NBA, NBA players, right? You, you've got Micah Parsons with his show every single week. You've got the Kelsey brothers with their show every single week, right? So there's a number of athletes that are now hosting their shows and 
you're seeing more and more content come from this. How have you kind of looked at this perspective of athlete, excuse me, of athlete driven content coming to the forefront? And, and what would you say to an athlete that might be hesitant to create their own content? Mm -hmm. So I personally love it. And uh, I, I, I love it for a few different reasons. Um, for so many years, uh, athletes have been the talent and they've just been the talent, right? They sign a contract for whatever amount and it seems great, but we never consider the factors of what's on the backside of that contract, right? Kevin Durant signs a contract for X millions of dollars to play for said team, but then he's playing on TV. So the organization has a media contract or a, a streaming deal or licensing or whatever that might be, right? So uh, I love the idea that athletes are creating their own content. And then some who are really are deeper in the game, then they take it a step further, right? And then they have their they have their own media company that houses their content, right? So um, I like the evolution of it. Uh, what I would say to the athlete who is uh, uncomfortable or hesitant about putting out content or creating their own content, just document your story, right? Just take time and like document your day. If you do TikTok, if you do Instagram, any of that stuff, right? If you have the uh, ability, have a friend record you or if you also have the ability, have somebody just sit down with you and ask you a couple of questions and you just answer them. And the reason I say that is because one thing we're also seeing rise even more than athlete-driven content or athlete-driven media is authenticity. People want to see the, the realness. People don't want to see the edited, filtered, crop cut videos. They want to see the real. They want somebody to tell them, like, entrepreneurship is hard. Life is hard. The transition is hard. And then show them how they made it out of there. So, uh, you know, that's what I say to the person who's, who's hesitant. Like, don't be hesitant because you have your own story and you can't get that wrong, right? You have your own journey, your own day. You can't, you can't mess that up. It's your day. I can't tell you how your day is supposed to operate or how your schedule is supposed to move. Uh, so just move forward with that and, and just know that it's really selfish for us to be shy at times, right? At times. Um, because whatever you might have struggled with, but then you overcame, that can help hundreds of thousands of millions of people. But if you never share it, then some people will never know how to make it through. And then honestly, some people may not make it through. So I encourage you to please don't be shy, but share, share your story, share where you're at, uh, share your struggle and definitely share your success. But we want to, you know, celebrate with you and, uh, just lift others as you continue to climb yourself. So one of the things that I can remember early in my career, and even still to this day, is through the jobs and the perseverance that I've kind of put into my own career, I still can't believe that my feet are in some of the rooms and that I'm talking to some of the people that I get a chance to talk to, right? So mm -hmm. that's one of the first things that I can remember is, you know, being at a conference where there were high level executives at, you know, the NBA commissioner sitting two seats down from me. You know what I mean? I'm getting it the chance to meet some of these very high ranking people and talk to them. For me, that that still to this day, like I said, is something that I, it's a pinch me type moment. Mm -hmm. When you started speaking, you're having these TED Talks, you're in some of these rooms that, you know, the 12 year old version of yourself probably can't believe, you know, you're in these rooms what are some of these thoughts, right? What what is take us inside kind of your mind, your gut, your heart when you step on stage for a TED talk or when you're stepping into, you know, a room at the University of Texas or or at Vanderbilt or some of these other places that you've talked and you're speaking to people that you probably never would have thought you would be in the same room with. Man, for me it's it's, it's gratitude cuz sometimes I'm overwhelmed with like the feeling. I I do get the 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 butterflies. Uh, a little bit because it's just like one I never you know I never made a division one so having the opportunity to be able to speak to division one athletes I did make it in a sense um but the but the biggest thing for me is just I hope that they understand the power of what could really happen if two of them one of them just leverage their voice. So that's the thought that goes on in my head. It's like, oh my goodness, I want to convey something 
to where they see, know, and understand the value and how to be able to share their story and their message because they'll reach people that I'll never reach just based on, you know, NIL and based on the influence and impact that they have at the University of Texas, right? I went to the University of Texas at Tyler. You know, they had the University of Texas at Austin. So, um, you know, going into these rooms and getting these opportunities before I stand up, it, it, it's really the opportunity for me to say, God, less of me, more of you. Uh, and the reason I say that is because these individuals need to hear something from whoever the presenter is, right? And I don't always know exactly what that is. But I'm just leaning, hoping, and praying that something resonates to give them that spark, uh, that nugget, that gem to where they can take it, they can apply it, and then they can make massive impact. So that's just what, what, it, what it's all about for me. Mm -hmm. So you've, like I said, you've had a chance to speak at a number of universities and, and um, meet a number of people. Um, I want I want a story, right? What give me a, give me a story of maybe it was your fir the first time you spoke, maybe it was your first TED talk, but give me a, a story that will always stick with you. Maybe it's it was somebody saying, you know, the impact that you made, but give me a story of, you know, one of these speeches that has had a true impact on you that let you know I'm doing the right thing. I'm I'm supposed to be here. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Uh, so I had the opportunity to speak at, um, it was an internship expo, probably about 400 um, high school students, juniors, sophomores. Uh, and I prepared for this thing, right? Did the PowerPoint, did pretty PowerPoint, all that, went over, did my, you know, went through everything I usually go through for a presentation, did my research, all that good stuff. 20, I had 20 minutes. So I'm getting ready to go up and the lady says, Jonathan, we're a little bit behind. And I said, okay. She said, I know you had 20 minutes. Can you do it in 10? And I was like, ah, uh, okay. Well, I'll try to make it work. Then she said, came back up to me two minutes later. She said, Jonathan, we're really running behind. Can you do it in eight? And I said, oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> uh, so long story short, I go up uh, and I said, hey guys, I had this long presentation I wanted to give y'all. I, I was going to give y'all a king size presentation, but now I'm going to give you a little bite size, a little fun size, <laughs> the fun size nugget. So ultimately, out of that, what ended up happening was I learned a couple of things. And I'm going to get to, I'm gonna get to what the person told me at the end, but I learned a couple of things. I learned that being a presenter and being a speaker is so much less about you than you might think, which was really, really, really humbling. But it's so much more about what the audience ne needs to receive from you before they leave. And then after I'm shaking the kids' hands, I'm talking to them, and a Hispanic gentleman came up to me, and he said, wow. He said, man, thanks for your presentation. And I said, sure, sure, no, no, no big deal. And then I ended up giving him one of my books, and he said, wow. And I said, what? He said, I've never seen a black author before. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I've never, I've never seen it before. And I said, oh my goodness. And I said, well, what do you want to be? Like, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be the president of the United States. And I was like, have you ever seen a Hispanic president before? He said, no. But that blew my mind just in terms of belief, right? Mm -hmm. This is a kid he's never seen, you know, the black author. And just like I've never seen, you know, we've never seen a Hispanic president. But still, he's believing for that and surrounding himself with those type of people and being in that space with the Internship Expo. So that was one of the things to where it was really humbling. Um, but I was grateful just to be there and grateful just to, you know, be able to share something to encourage him in that way. So that, that was a pretty, pretty neat experience for me. That's pretty impactful for sure. Now, we're coming to the end of our conversation. And before, you know, I let you go, um, one thing I need is a piece of advice. And then I want you to let the people know that are listening and watching where they can find you, how they can get in contact with you. Maybe they want you to come speak. Maybe they just want to connect something, right? Let people know a piece of advice and how they can find you. For sure, man. Uh, before I do that, man, thanks so much for the, for the opportunity to, you know, be on the platform and uh, thanks for all that you all do with, you know, with athletes to athletes. So just want to, want to give you all your, your kudos uh, there. 
<clears throat> a piece of advice for an athlete. A piece of advice for an athlete. I would say shoot your shot. And shooting your shot for me would mean taking the time to ask that question to an individual, whoever it might be that you desire to get to know more about or you know want to learn about their industry. Uh, it would be sending that message, sending that DM on Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever it might be. But then I want to give you a bonus tip to that. Record it. Whatever they say, say, do, well, do you mind if I just record this really quick? Because I want to make sure that I can be fully present with you, but I make sure I don't miss what you said so I can apply it later, right? So shoot your shot and then get that thing recorded. So that way you can go back and, you know, you can take all the notes you need to take and, you know, do whatever you need to do to get all you can out of the information to where it leads to application instead of just motivation, right? So that would be my tip. The uh, ways that people can connect with me, um, first, I want to say Beyond the Ball Beyond the Ball with Jonathan Jones, right? That's my podcast. It's everywhere, YouTube, Instagram, all that good stuff. But you can find me, Jonathan Jones Speaks, on all platforms. Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-J-O-N-E-S-S-P-E-A-K-S. Jonathan Jones Speaks. That's me. Nice. Well, I guess, I mean, this is great. I'm glad we had a chance to connect. I'm glad you reached out. Um, and we, you know, finally had a chance to get you on here. Hopefully, you know, we're both in Texas, so hopefully we'll at some point we'll be in the same place, same time. We can meet in person. Um, but man, this is good. This is this was awesome. I loved all the all the tips and the nuggets and things that you gave, especially your story of, you know, going from that, you know, that kid falling asleep in the back of the class to the kid in the front of the class to the kid teaching the class. Right. So that really showed a lot of perseverance and um, I think that's what a lot of people need to need to hear is it doesn't matter where you start. It just matters where you finish. Right. So, um, Jonathan, this is a great conversation. Um, got anything else for us before I let you go? Man, one, one, once, once again, thanks for, for all, all, all that you all do, man. And if I could, if I could be a resource, uh, to athletes, to athletes at all, just please let me know. Please let me know. I appreciate it. I appreciate it for sure. Like I said, hopefully we get a chance to meet in person pretty soon. I'm going to let you get on to the rest of your day. So uh, thanks a lot, Jonathan. This was awesome. All right. Thanks, man. Later. Thank you for listening to the Athletes to Athletes podcast. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss when another episode drops. Again, we appreciate you listening and we'll see you again next time.